one to know why I'm in love with you.
Tell somebody, say, forever is a long time. Say, but God loves you that long.
I found love in you And no other love will do That's why I love you
Tell somebody, say, forever is a long time. Say, but God loves you that long. Into the perfect harmony This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you love me You love me This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you No other love will do Every moment that you smile Chases all the pain away Forever and a while And my heart is where you'll stay This is why I love you this is why I love you Because you love me You love me This is why I love you oh, This is why I love you Because Stars have all aligned and right now is the perfect time to say I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you
Tell somebody, say, forever is a long time. Say, but God loves you that long. Into the perfect harmony This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you love me You love me This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you No other love will do Every moment that you smile Chases all the pain away Forever and a while And my heart is where you'll stay This is why I love you this is why I love you Because you love me You love me This is why I love you oh, This is why I love you Because you love me You love me The stars have all aligned and right now is the perfect time to say I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you
found love in you And no other love will do That's why I love you
Tell somebody, say, forever's a long time. Say, but God loves you that long. Into the perfect harmony This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you love me You love me This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you No other love will do Every moment that you smile Chases all the pain away Forever and a while And my heart is where you'll stay and This is why I love you this is why I love you Because you love me You love me This is why I love you oh, This is why I love you Because Stars have all aligned and right now is the perfect time to say 
I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I do. This is why I love you. This is why I love you. Because you love me. You love me. This is why. I found love in you And no other love will do That's why I love you Oh
Tell somebody, say, forever's a long time. Say, but God loves you that long. Into the perfect harmony This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you love me You love me This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you And no other love will do Every moment that you smile Chases all the pain away Forever and a while In my heart is where you'll stay and This is why I love you
plenty Living life without apology It's not wrong, dear I belong here So you might as well get used to me My mother may not be the queen But my father's king of everything to the family yeah. So I guess that makes me royalty And it gives me dominion My name is uh, Valerie Smith, and I'm one of the uh, ministers here in the house. And this is my husband, George Smith. And I'm going to start out with a new, with an Old Testament reading. And this reading will describe the person of Harriet. Proverbs 31, starting with verse 10. A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. 
Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night and provides food for her family and portions for her family servants. She's considered a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her straight trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household. For all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes covering for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate. Where he takes his seat among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instructions in her tongue. She watches over the affairs of, the household, of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also the praises, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you suppress them all. Charm is deceitful, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. And good morning, family. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, out of the NIV states that, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We'll read verse 14. Out of the NIV states that and declares, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Praise the Lord. God bless you. May the Lord have a blessing on the reader and the doers of his most holy word. Good morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we pray the Holy Spirit, our comforter, to be manifested as we celebrate the life of your precious daughter, Harriet Skates. Your word declares, Father, that your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. So we reverence you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Our sister Harriet knew you intimately as her Lord and her Savior. She spent time with you, Lord God, as the Holy Spirit directed her path in the life that she led. In the name of the Lord, you're the one, Lord, that casts visions. You're the one that put the vision in Harriet's heart for preschools. That she was able to touch precious lives of children, which are the most precious.
precious and vulnerable people in the earth. We thank you, Lord God, for the life that you allowed her to live in the name of the Lord Jesus. We give you praise. You made your decision, your vision, vivid to her, Lord, for us the preschools. And that's very important, Father God, because you said it's better that a millstone be tied around your neck than to harm one of the little ones, Father. So we bless you. Holy Spirit, you molded her. She was sensitive. She was loving. She was kind. She was patient. She was understanding. So we praise you for imparting all those godly attributes into her spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus. She was a loving and faithful wife. The word of the Lord says that she loved her husband. She took care of her children with her patience, her selflessness, her long suffering. She had a heart of giving, a gentle, sweet spirit that only comes from you. So we bless you for this life, Father, that touched so many lives along the path of her life. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor for molding her, being a loving wife to Brother John, faithful and true, a woman of prayer and intercession, being attentive and caring mother to her children, John Jr., Kenyatta, Johanna, and Asia. We bless you for giving her a heart and a desire to be an example to the next generation. Oh God, you're so faithful. You're the one that determines life and death because you are the redeemer, because you give eternal life and they shall never, ever perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of your hand. So we bless you for the godly legacy that our sister Harriet led. As she poured into the life of her children, as she spent time in intimacy with the Father in prayer, in meditation on the word of the Lord. So we thank you, Lord God, for touching her enabling her to touch so many lives along the way. So we're here today, a precious Holy Spirit, to celebrate a life of love, giving, compassion, faithfulness, long-suffering, understanding. We thank you, Lord God, because you are truly worthy, because you are the true and living God. Let us say amen. some of our favorites, some of her favorites, some of his favorites. We're just going to bless the name of the Lord. And you don't have to be glued to those seats if you don't need to. We're going to have a good time and celebrate the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody put those hands together. Let's bless him. Hallelujah. Woo! Here we go. We overcome by the blood. Come on. Thank you. 
Amen. Amen. He reigns forever. Does he reign forever? I said, does he reign forever? Come on, sing it one more time. He reigns forever. Come on, I want to hear you say it. He reigns forever. you through just a little while. I want on behalf of our Bishop Raphael and our pastor Brenda Green, we, all of us, from the Governing Board of Elders to the Urban Kids Club, welcome you here today. We hope that you feel welcome because you are absolutely welcome. God bless you. I'm a little saddened because of the reason we have gathered here. We have to say farewell to our sister, Harriet Kenyatta Skates. And when I heard that John wanted to celebrate, I said, yeah, we're gonna celebrate the life of Sister Harriet. Yeah, we're gonna celebrate the life of Sister Harriet. They said, no, John wants to celebrate I said, yeah, of course, we're going to celebrate the life of Sister Harry. No, 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 you don't get it. We got to wear this, we're going to do that, we're going to sing, we're going to shout, we're going to praise, and I'm like, oh, okay, sign me up, sign me up. But I just want to say this, and then I'm gonna, we're going to go. I just want to say this, that I know that John and John the fourth and Kenyatta and Johanna and Asia are, and mom and all the family are hurting. I know that they are. I know. I sat right there. I kind of know. Yeah. They're going to miss that beautiful smile, those deep dimples. You know what I'm talking about? Those deep, beautiful dimples, that, that tough hair right there, that bad haircut, and the color she can color her hair, and that cushy. I mean, have you ever held her? She cushy. I just love to lean into Sister Harriet. They're going to miss that and so much more. But I know that John, I said, Lord, help me understand what John means when he says celebrate. And I believe that the Lord dropped this in my spirit. We all have a decision to make. The decision, there's, we make a lot of decisions, but the greatest decision that we have to make is whether to live for the Lord or not. John knew, John knew that Harriet had made the right decision. She is reconciled to her God. That means that she received Jesus in her life, not just that day, but every day since. And she's lived for him. John must have heard Jesus in the word when Jesus said, don't be amazed. One day is coming 
when those who are in the grave hear my voice and rise and those who have done good will rise and live but those who have not those who have lived evil will rise and be condemned let me let me just let me just ask you if you haven't made that decision you need to make the, the, the right decision like Harriet did. And I'm going to tell you, that's why John can celebrate today because he knows where his girl is. He knows where his girl is. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Glory to your name. Bless your name. So, uh, you know, I could go on and on and on. I could go on and on and on, but I'm not. We're going to get this celebration started. I don't know if I'm going to come back up here or not. Because you have... Thank you. I need a little help up here. Because when the Holy Ghost gets to moving on the inside... But we got to get this celebration started with none other than our sister Kim Rose all the way from somewhere in Texas. It don't say Kim, but come on Kim, bless us with a celebration song. God bless you. Hallelujah. Come on, bless his name. Hallelujah. Hey, say I was going to say something else, but the Lord spoke to me while I was sitting over there. Isaiah 6 and 1 says, when King Uzziah died, I see the Lord high and lifted up and his train fills his temple. Come on with me. Come on in the room, Holy Ghost. Hi, come on in the room. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Hey, yeah, yeah. Bless the Lord. I'm trying to sing the song, but the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. Some of you sitting in this room, this is what the Lord told me while I was on the airplane. He said he wants a yes. It's time to stop playing. He wants a yes. When you turn on the television and you turn on your phone, don't you hear the prophets saying? Don't you hear the prophets of the Lord and in this house? The Lord is coming soon. And don't let them catch you with your work undone. Hallelujah. I will bless the Lord. Oh my soul and oh that is within me oh I will bless his name and give him all the glory because he's dead yeah he's done this thing now here it is with the Lord now you gotta make it now. She ran her race. Now you gotta run yours too. He's calling you. You don't know the day and the hour. But come on. The Bible says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Come on, get in your dwelling place. That's where you're going to hear God. Now, I'm not standing up here saying this because it sounds good. This is what I do in the morning. I get into the secret place of the Most High God. And He orders. He will order your day. Because you need Him, need Him, need Him to make it this day so I'm telling you come on in the room come on come
come on into the secret place of the Most High God. Come on, come on, come on. Come on in the room. Ha! He's got treasures. He's got blessings. Oh, he's got lots and lots of blessings waiting, waiting on you. Come on, lift your hands in this place. Now I'm going to step into a place most of you may not be familiar and some will. But I'm going to talk to the Most High God and you are privy to hear it. So if you hear it, come on in the room with me. Yes, yes. I hear the Lord saying he wants a yes. He wants a yes. He wants a yes. Yes, yes Lord. Yes, 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 Lord. Oh, don't you feel the presence of the Lord? Come on in the room, Holy Ghost. Yellow bo sata like eshi. Come on in the room, Holy Ghost. Do your work, do your work, do your work, Lord. Come on in the room, Holy Ghost. Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Come on, lift your hands. This I'm going to do what God told me. Lift your hands if you need a healing in your body. God, we come against the very demon of diabetes in the name of Jesus. The spirit of fear, we cast you out in the name of Jesus. And we command high blood pressure to go down. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, every blood disease. In the name of Jesus, come on, Holy Ghost. Are you catching it? This is in your private time. Come on, Holy Ghost. He'll make it right. Yellow bossa. He'll make it right. Just say yes to him in your private place. Mm-hmm. And we thank you, Lord. Amen. We thank the Lord for Sister Kim and how she shared. Come on, give her a big hand clap. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Kim, for sharing with us what the Lord has given you this morning. Thank God for that. All right. Uh, I'm sorry if I came out a little, you know, too, too, too much, too hard. Too, if I came out too hard, but I'm here to celebrate with Brother John. God bless Brother John. God bless all of you who are here today. We're going to try to continue to go on. Um, the program now calls for special remarks from these people in this order. Elder Marie Jackson from Memphis, Tennessee. Are you here, Elder Marie? Okay, you'll come first. Then Julius B. Anthony. Then our own Quincy, Minister Quincy Moore. Would you come in that order, please? Elder Marie Jackson, Julius Anthony, and then Quincy Moore. Would you say amen for them? Good morning. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is a celebration. 
and we have had a good time thus far. I call it an honor to stand before you all and to represent Obey. When John called me Sunday, I said, John, hold on, let me back up. First, give an honor to my Lord and Savior, to the shepherd of this house and all the ministers on the platform, to John, the kids, my auntie, my sisters, the children, and my family. It is an honor. It is an honor to stand before you guys to talk about somebody that I love dearly. Let me tell you about where I came from. We come from East Tennessee. East Tennessee. A little old country city down by Memphis, Tennessee. And let me tell you, who, and you said, who is she? Ain't nobody. My mama and her mama are sisters. And every year we had to come up here, every year they had to go down there. So we became sisters in Christ. But y'all, but what I do love about standing here talking about Harriet, and I'm going to tell you, she was married to the same man 32 years. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, can't you be don't say that? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> and then she had four blessed children. Blessed children. And then when you got kids that you honored, that's a blessing. Then she had a mother that worked for her every day. And I don't know if me and Lois could be working every day. I'm just saying. That's my mama. But they work together every day. That's a blessing. And Lord, the most what I did like about her and that we all should like about her. She was a woman of God. And all I can say is when she called my name, she called it with gracefulness. She said, lady, lady, lady. And that's an honor. But you all, God's so fit to call her home. And another thing, I don't know, she had her own business. She was an entrepreneur for years. God took, plan, took time to place her over somebody's kids to teach her about the God that God had given her. That's a blessing. But what I want to share with my family and friends, one thing that I love about Harriet, that she had a heart of love. And let me tell you about that word love. I ain't gonna be here long because my son said he's gonna pull him a dress tail. <laughs> let me tell you about that word love. We take that love, that little bitty word, and we throw that word around so, so much. But love is not a feeling, y'all. Love is a commitment. Yes. So let me tell you what God said. God said in 1 Corinthians 13 and 41, then I said, Lord, if I had to say anything about Harriet, what would I say? He said, tell them how much she loved everybody. Tell them how much she had the love in her heart for everybody. And then I looked back and I said, God, we take it for granted so much. That little bitty four-letter word called love. He said, but tell him what I said about love. He said, love is the greatest gift that I can give you. He said, each day I give you love. Each day I give you God's love. And then he said, go on and tell him what I said. He said, first the rest would say, love is not Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. Love is not arrogant. Love is not resentment. He said, if, I, if you don't have love, family, you don't have nothing. 
If you don't have love, you don't have nothing. And then he went on to say, how in the world can you sit there and say, I love you? How in the world, if you can sit there and say, I love you, that you have not seen me? But you can't even love your sisters and brothers standing right next to you. I said, how can you do that? He said, if you, don't, if you sit there and you say you don't love me, you love me, but I don't love my sisters, and I don't love my mother, and I don't love my auntie, because he said, we living in the dad now, it will happen. He said, you're a liar. So my family, friends, and any woman of God, a man of God that said they love God, they got to love one another. So that I say to my family, to my friends, put down the hammer on forgiveness. Because that, that hammer can be mighty heavy. Put down the, the hammer of unforgiveness and pick up the sword of love. Because let me tell you something about Harriet. I'm sure she picked up that sword and she touched that man. And she touched that woman. And she touched that woman. And she went on down and she touched the husband. And she touched the kids. And she touched the mother. And she touched the sister. You need a sword of love in your hand. That you can walk around and swipe everybody because the sword ain't in And put down the hammer on forgiveness. And pick up the sword of love. Because the Bible say, without love, we're nothing. And I'm going to tell you something about me and Harriet. <laughs> We're something. Because one thing I do know about it, she was saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And you cannot have that unless you have the heart of love. God bless you. God bless you. Julius, are you here? Come on, Julius Anthony. God, give him a hand. Come on, y'all. Y'all feel some love. Come on now. Yeah. Good morning, Julius. How are you? Welcome. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. By faith, we know the elders obtained a good rapport with God. By faith, God spoke a word and the entire world came into existence. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. And God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Harry Skates was a woman of profound faith. And she absolutely was a faithful and diligent seeker of God. If you have ever worked in early childhood care and education today or in the future or in the past, would you please stand and continue to stand for just a minute? Everybody in the room who has worked in early childhood care and education. And continue to stand. Now, John, I want you to stand and look around this room. Look at all of your people, your community, we want you to know that we are here and that we love you. And we are here to celebrate with you. We're not here to cry tears. We're here to celebrate life, to celebrate Harriet, and to celebrate you too. You may be seated. You see, God gave Harriet an awesome gift and an awesome purpose. And what was so beautiful about Harriet is that she allowed God to glorify himself in her every day. 
And through that, she transformed the lives of thousands of children and thousands of teachers, thousands of educators. She changed lives. And so I want to share with you an affirmation, an affirmation we typically teach to children. But I think it describes who Harriet was. And I think this is something that she would want us to say today because it's all about faith. This affirmation is entitled, My Pledge Allegiance to Me. And it's written by Dr. Edna Hanks Pipes. And it simply says, I can be the best by doing my best in everything I do. By taking pride in who I am, my faith will see me through. I must have respect and confidence if I am to be a healthy body, a productive mind, and a wise human being. So I can be my best by doing my best and everything I do by taking pride in who I am, my faith will see me through. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. By faith, we know the elders obtained a good relationship with God, just like Sister Harriet. We know by faith that God spoke a word and this entire world came into being. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. For God is a rewarder of those who faithfully and diligently seek him. God bless you. Hey Amen. His brother Quincy is coming. Why don't you just stand up right quick? Come on, get on your feet right quick. Just stand up right fast. Hurry up. Hurry up. Come on, stretch out. Stretch out a little bit. You know, wave your hand. Tell the Lord, thank you. Tell the Lord, thank you. Tell him again, thank you, Lord. Now sit down. Good morning, Brother Quincy. I mean, Minister Quincy, God bless you. She's crazy, y'all. I love her, though. All that energy. Um, when John asked me to say a few words about Harriet, to be honest, I did not feel worthy to do so. And, uh, but I couldn't say no. That's my brother. And to be honest, I'm honored to be able to say anything about this woman of God. In knowing Harriet for over 25 years now, I've seen all these kids grow up. Um, we've all gotten older. And one thing has remained the same. I never ever saw her without a smile, ever. Maybe you have. I have not. In 25 years, I've never, ever seen her without a smile, ever. And I think that's pretty remarkable. But the theme in this house for the year is love and live excellently, right? It's, I don't believe in coincidences that we're here today celebrating someone who lived and loved excellently. Now, excellence is not the same as perfection. None of us are perfect, but she loved excellently. You ask me, well, how do you know she loved excellently? Just look in this room. Every single person in here, at some, in some way, shape, or form, was touched by Harriet. You're not just here because you know John or the kids. In some way, shape, or form, every single person in here was touched by Harriet. 
And I know this is a celebration, but this one hit me different. Um, three weeks ago today, we stood on this platform and we were rehearsing for a play. And y'all know John's a thespian, so I was directing him on how to do this scene. And I told him to look at this wall and imagine what you would say to your wife if it was the last thing you were going to say. Three weeks ago today, nothing in him or in me knew that five days later, that would be the last time. Why do I say that? We take life for granted. We do it every day. And this one hit me different. If you know John and Harriet, and I know I'm 25 seconds, but I'm gonna be shorter than some other folks, so I'm, I'm gonna keep pushing. I see the clock ticking, but y'all gotta give me my two. Give me my two more, okay? I prepared for this one, I prepared. So, again, this one hit me a little differently because when you know, you know you have arrived in marriage when y'all become one name. So, I'm sorry, but there's never been a time where I've said Harriet's name without John's name. It's always been you know who you should ask? John and Harriet. Well, why don't you go get John and Harriet? It's never, ever been just one. And I think it's amazing because I'm witnessing the grace of God in full form when I'm watching John throughout this whole process. God is amazing. So if you really know John and Harriet and you know love, they were like teenagers all the time. Like they had just met and they whispering and giggling and tickling and touching. And I would see them and I would be like, man, they still doing all of that. <laughs> and to be honest, to be honest, I used to be like, man, that just ain't me. I stand corrected. I need to be just like that. So today, and my wife, she, she's like, oh, you just emotional. Trust me, baby, it's different now. I have seen how to lay down my life. Thank you to my brother, to my sister. <laughs> I know she's smiling, because I'm smiling. God bless. Bless you, Brother Quincy. Man, we can't take these moments for granted. Please. From this day forward, let's don't take life for granted because you never ever know. We are all appointed. We have an appointment. God is going to ask for his breath back. Did you hear me? I know you know. Come on, let's love each other. Care about each other. Don't cut me off on the highway when I'm trying to get to Illinois. Be good to me. The program now calls for acknowledgments and condolences, and I'm going to do that right now. BOCOM, servicing the needs of families, Saturday, September 9th, 2023, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. John and family, though your hearts be heavy, 
There is assurance from above. When you truly love the ones you lose, you will never ever lose the ones you love. We, the management and staff of, at BOCOM Life Celebration Center, genuinely extend our heartfelt sympathy during the celebration of life of your loved one, Mrs. Harriet Kenyatta Skates. May you find comfort in knowing that we are praying with you and for you in this time of bereavement, humbly submitted by Calvin O. and Regina A. Bocom, Bocom's Life Celebration Center. Christian Union Church, Total Concept Mission 4150, West Bell Street, St. Louis, Missouri, September 9th, 2023. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. We are here today to seek the comfort of God as another link from the chain has been broken when the human spirit of Mrs. Harriet Kenyatta Skates took flight at the call of the Heavenly Father from this, this earthly labor by a wise and loving God. The Christian Union Church family, Elder Jean A. Smith Pastor, extends to Brother John and Sister Catherine Skates. Is that mommy? Is that mom, Catherine? Just a member of the family? Okay. And the entire family, our sincere and heartfelt condolences and that you are in our thoughts and prayers. We, we pray that our Father's loving arms will embrace, comfort, and sustain you and your family during this hour of bereavement. God has reminded us through his holy word in Matthew 5, 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Although you mourn, know that Harriet's passing will be remembered by the family as having brought eternal joy, fellowship with God, and a crown of righteousness. Your family will have many, many beautiful memories of Harriet. She made a difference in so many ways and in so many lives. Harriet left a legacy for her natural family and her friends before God called her from this life. Let it be a comfort to you to know that God will never leave you or forsake you. He will give you peace, a peace that's above all understanding. If we can be of service to you now and in the future, please do not hesitate to call. Humbly submitted, the Christian Union Church family, Elder Jean A. Smith, pastor. From Metro Christian Worship Center, from the heart of God to the heart of the urban world with love, brother John Skates and family. Dearest John, John the fourth or fifth, which one are you, John? You're the fifth? Did you hear that? It's John the fifth. So John, that makes you John the fourth. My Lord, what a legacy. Dearest John, John V, Kenyatta, Johanna, Asia, and family, we were saddened to hear of the passing of your beloved wife, mother, sister, aunt, and loved one, Harriet. We extend to you our heartfelt condolences. We love you and are praying earnestly for you and the rest of the family. We trust and accept the Lord to comfort and uphold you during this season. We know she will be greatly missed. Sister Harriet was a very special woman of God, of genuine character, integrity, and love. She gave of herself totally and completely as a handmaiden of God for his purposes. She is one of those rare people who allowed God to use her mightily. She left us unexpectedly, but apparently in God's perfect timing. We will only fully understand God's reason once we are reunited. Nonetheless, with weeping and hope-filled spirits, we accept God's will that we will conf and, and we are confident we will see her again. Even though we have endured similar experiences, 
There is no way we can say what we fully comprehend, that we fully comprehend what you're feeling at this time. However, we want you to know that we care deeply. We are praying to the one who does know exactly how you feel, precisely what you need, and is perfect in his ministry, especially in times like these. He loves you and understands everything that you're going through. We remind you to cling to him in faith like never before. As you already know, life with Christ beyond death is our eternal inheritance and he is our unshakable anchor, especially now. Unshakable anchor. It is our sincere desire that even through this, as painful as it is, that God's still, small voice and his loving message of love will be heard and received deep within your heart. In a similar situation, Jesus spoke the following words to a woman in the Bible whose only brother had died. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. John eleven twenty five. 25. And this is still true today. Rest in knowing that you will see and be joined with your loved one, Harriet, once again. Until then, we encourage you to live in the strength of the legacy she left you, the covenant wealth of your family, the power and richness of his word, the unsurpassable love of Christ, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, and the comfort of your metro family and extended family members. Grace and peace from Bishop Raphael and Pastor Brenda Green and the Metro Christian Worship Center family. Metro, are you here? Stand up and give them some love. Come on, Metro, stand up and give this family some love. Amen. We love you. We love you, John. We love you, Skates family. And we thank the Lord for you. Amen. Um, at this time, I can say something, I want to say something, but I'm not because I don't want them to run that clock on me. I'm going to just say, simply say this. I love you. God bless you. I'm praying for you. The one thing I will say is this. I got to say this. Now I'm going to sit down. That unbelievers, they meet up only to part. But we believers, we part only to meet up one day. Hallelujah! Glory to God. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus, for our hope. Ha, da, da, da. Thank you, Jesus, for that. This mic is hot, and I'm getting ready to give it up. Here's what's about to happen in your life right now. There's going to be a musical musical selection from Metro Christian Worship Center and after that you will hear the voice of our own Bishop Raphael Green and then I'm done it has been an honor to serve you today John God bless you I love you come on Metro come on let's sing for the people let's sing for them let's sing and bless bless their hearts those who may be standing in the brink, you just on the edge, you on the fence, you don't know, should I say yes, should I say no, what should I do? Listen to me. Okay, I might look like I don't know what's going on. I might sound like I don't know what's going on. I got some education. But I'm going to tell you right now. Asking Jesus to come into my life was the best decision I ever made. He changed my life. He made me new. And if you're looking for newness in life, just ask him. God bless you. God keep you. God love you. Amen. Come on, Metro. Let's sing. Amen. Uh, on the program, they have uh, life reflections uh, of a boss. I read silently soft music. I believe we're going to do that now before we sing our last song. Thanks, Herb. Thank you. That's okay. I know Vita gets caught up. She get caught up. She get caught up. And once she get up to that third heaven, I can't get her back down. <laughs> so if you would read silently, life reflections, I think he's going to play, play some music. I 
found love in you And I've learned to love me too Never have I felt that I could be all that you see It's like our hearts have intertwined into the perfect harmony This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you love me You love me This is why I love you Ooh, this is why I love you Because you And no other love will do Every moment that you smile Chases all the pain away Forever and a while And my heart is where you'll stay and This is why I love you
everybody, let's sing it together. Come on, time. I believe, I believe, I believe. Every single promise, here I stand, on the word just spoken, Lord, I believe. I believe you, God. Abraham, the friend of God in the Bible, had a wife that could not bear them children. But El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God, just spoke a word that changed their lives forever. Abraham believed. Come on, if you can, stand on your Come on, feet join us. Sing this song together. together. Hey, come on, I believe you. I believe, I believe you, I Father. And I receive every single promise. Here I stand on the word just spoken. Lord, I believe. Oh, I bless your name. Praise you, Jesus. One more verse. Yes, I believe that everything you've shown me in your own time it will be manifested <laughs> what do I need anoint me please Jesus give me wisdom and knowledge following you I can't lose for winning yes Lord I believe Come on, somebody bless the Lord. Somebody lift your hands. Let's worship Him together. Lift your hands. Come on, sing. I believe. Uh and I receive every single promise. Here I stand on the word you've spoken. Lord, I believe. Oh, I bless you in the midst of the storm. I believe you, God. Come on, let's sing it together one more time. I believe. And I receive. Every single promise, here I stand, on the word just spoken, Lord I believe, I lift my hands, I praise you anyway, I believe you, I believe you, God. Somebody bless the Lord, come on, praise the Lord. One of the daughters in the house, Katrina, come on, bless you. Amen. Good to see you. Praise the Lord, everybody. My brother John asked for this song. I don't know the song, but I know the Jesus of the song. Amen. Praise the Lord. I thank God for the heritage of being a member of Metro Christian Worship Center. And my dear sister Harriet, we learned here, Bishop and Pastor Brenda, that if our lives don't glorify God, then we're not living. 
Amen. And I saw her in her everyday life as a mother, as a wife, as a teacher, as a business owner, live her life for his glory. We've shared so many things, and I've told John, hallelujah, the love that she had for her husband and her children, how she ministered to me and mentored me, an older woman, to love my husband and children. So I give the glory to God today, and I sing this to his glory. Help me out. The words are there. You guys sing it with me, please. Praise the Lord.
we're standing on holy ground and I can see angels all around Jesus you change everything we're standing on holy ground we're standing on holy ground we're standing on holy ground Jesus you change everything. the way Let's pray together. If you don't mind, just touch the person that you're sitting next to. God, you know why we're here. And we trust you today to bring healing to the hearts of this family, the friends who have gathered. Cause us to understand what we would never get apart from your input in our lives. We live our lives to please you but we live in the pleasure of knowing that you are our God. Apart from you, there really is no reason to live that is enduring and lasting and fulfilling. I pray for those today who are in confusion and pain, that you would minister your grace, destroy every religious notion that is blocking the heart from seeing your love. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Thank you, everyone. I want to say that we are, we love you very much, John, and the rest of the family that's here, the children and mom and all of you are very special to us. I know we haven't met some of you personally, um, but uh, your, your wife, your mom, your daughter, your sister, your cousin, your auntie, uh, our sister. And we loved it very much. And we're thankful for the time we had. get myself together here.
when I think about the, uh, I'll just read my little notes because they're going to put me on a time or two. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to say in reference to her life and We've gathered uh, here today to do something that's been done by Christians and even people of various religious faiths for literally thousands of years. But for those of us who are believers in Christ, we've gathered to celebrate the life and we also celebrate the transition of our beloved sister in Christ, Sister Harriet Gates. And as you've seen, we've done it through praise and worship and tears, while simultaneously mourning her transition from this dimension of reality to the next. Admittedly, it's very difficult to do this because of the pain we all feel and the partial understanding that we have as we do it. Nonetheless, we are doing it and will continue to do it in the days, the weeks, and the months, and the years to come. For those of us who have relationships with God through Jesus, this seemingly incompatible combination of celebration in grief is possible only because of the God-given certainty that we have in our hearts that she is one of his daughters and has gone to be with him. And also because of the promise that we, her church family, along with her husband and immediate family, that we will be reunited someday. As you've already heard from various family members and friends, Harriet, I won't say was, but is one of the most precious and beautiful souls we've ever been blessed by God to meet and know. I stand here to echo that conviction and sentiment. My experience and my wife's experience was the same as many who have talked to you today. Those who knew her, those who experienced life with her. From my earliest meeting, Brenda and I were enthralled with her contagious love, her infectious smile, her outer and inner beauty, her distinguished poise, her sober perspective, and her patient approach to life. I personally found her to be one of the most genuine and authentic young women I've ever met. Shortly after meeting, a verse of scripture popped into my mind during our earliest days, over 25 years ago now, which I believe the Lord helped me, used to help me understand the person that we had just met. The insight is in St. John chapter 1, verse 47. It is the assessment and the revealing words of Jesus spoken about a man by the name of Nathaniel, as Nathaniel came to Jesus. Scripture says, Jesus said of him, Nathaniel, one who is an Israelite indeed, one in whom there is no guile. The Greek term there is the word dalas, and it means bait. It's a figurative term for deceit or trickery. When it's used, it's basically speaking of bait that's being used to allure or hook people, especially those festering in excessive emotional pain, in many cases brought on by themselves. It's a word that means a decoy to snare or to deceive people, and hence it implies treachery to exploit the naive. In our experience, Harriet Gates is like Nathaniel. Flaws and all, she loved the Lord and strove to make his love known in a guileless manner at all times. 
Later, I was amazed and I, as I got to know her and John. As Quincy said, there was always John and Harriet. I became aware of her immense talents, her creativity, her steadfastness of character, her tenacious faith, her business desires and acumen. She was a woman with a quiet but compelling spirit, wasn't really boisterous and loud. The Bible calls that something special. Not in our culture, but it was, it is to God. We found her to be strong and bold and courageous in Christ as well. She was confident in God, a ride or die covenant wife, and a mother who was second to none. We were inspired and prodded by her calling and devotion to ensure the welfare and the proper preparation of children for life. In her mind, she and her husband focused on the youngest in our in a generational mix. Her determination to be and to introduce them and nurture them in Christ and his kingdom was her passion. I didn't know her in her BC days before she came to Christ, but then at the time I knew her, she proved to be a devoted follower of Jesus, a person whose character was worth emulating. She would be sorely missed, as I'm sure many of us have said. The only thing that makes this time bearable is the reality of Jesus Christ, the credibility of his life, of his death and of his resurrection and of his claims. The only thing that sustains us through this is the superiority of his kingdom and the inevitable fulfillment of his eternal promises that he will return. He will end the hellish madness in our world and establish his rule on the earth. So John, J5, Kenyatta, Johanna, Asia, mom, dad, and family, sis. All the family and friends who are here in the Metro family, I know we've done it, but can we just take just more, one more few seconds here before I've delivered the homily and pause and quietly lift your hands, close your eyes. Praise the Lord for this precious life, for this priceless life. Thank him. She's gone, but uh, let's release any unhealthy holes we still have. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Heal us, O oh Lord. Cause this family to be able to move forward in the moments and the years to come. Thank you, Jesus. My thoughts will come from uh, not just my thoughts, what I believe is a directive for us today. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter three, and just for the interest of time, I'm going to read just a couple of verses there and then Hebrews chapter nine, verses 27 to 28. If you're not familiar uh, too much with church and how we do things, the reason why we read scripture is, is as you know, it's not just a ritual. It, it is historical, we've done it, as I mentioned, for thousands of years as a church. But it's because the Word of God is different from all other philosophical, ideological ideas and concepts. The scripture says that the entrance of the Word of God gives light. 
Jesus said, even when he was ministering, that his words are spirit and life. And so we read so that we're not just sharing and talking out of our own heads, but we're speaking and echoing what he has to say. And we speak in concert and seek to live in concert with him. Don't get me wrong, religion has its place, but it's no substitute for what I'm talking about. In many ways, it misleads people from the reality of what it means to have a life in God. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, richest man that we know of at the time that lived. And uh, near the end of his life, he looks back and reflects and he has a lot to say. And one of the things he has to say in this book is that everything in spite of all the billions of dollars that he's earned and gotten and all the women that he's had and all the things that he's built, that it's all, he uses a Hebrew term that means vain and also can mean an enigma. That at the end of the day, it was an illusion. It didn't lead where he thought it was going to lead. And chapter three, he's kind of recounting from his perspective, a God-inspired perspective, I should add, something that we want to know today. It says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. I want to read the next verse, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plan and a time to pluck what is planted. It's a time to kill, not murder, but there's a time to kill. There is the lawful taking of life, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. I'll jump to verse 11. He has made everything beautiful or appropriate in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Hebrews chapter 9. It's a part of a book in the Bible known as a, a Catholic epistle. Epistle means a letter. It doesn't refer to Roman Catholicism as a word that means universal. And it was sent around to many people. But in this particular case, it was addressed to individuals who were Jewish by birth, some of whom had come into relationship with God through Yeshua, the Hebrew pronunciation of the name for Jesus, and they had been ostracized and kicked to the curb and excommunicated and disenfranchised and disinherited because of that decision. This book was written primarily to encourage them, but there are some underlining warnings there which we will not have time to get into. Near the end of it, the writer reminds them of this one reality having already encouraged them to really maintain their, their, their walk with God by faith. And so, uh, but he says this, I'll start with verse 27. It is appointed for men to die once. Carries that same idea of time. It's appointed, the word is, means it's reserved. It's like when you make a reservation to go to 
a hotel or to uh, a club or to dinner or uh, to go to a, an athletic event, uh, there's a reservation. It's already set. There's an appointed time for human beings to die once and after this, the judgment. In the same manner, so Christ was offered once in light of that appointment to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. May God bless the reading of his word. Recently, a long time sister in Christ, a former member, just a couple of days ago, in fact, and a current ministry associate, acknowledged that she noticed several leading ladies, she called them, that have been transitioning or dying, and she therefore called and asked me, or really sent me a text, she didn't really call, uh, what insights the Lord may have been giving to me in light of this. She said it's happening a lot in the city where she's from. As I prayerfully reflected, I, I, I of course thought about your leading lady. And I related the following reasons to her. I feel like I need to share some of this with you today. Uh, a number of uh, passages of scripture we won't be able to go through. I'm a teacher, so I, I, I want to do that, but time is ticking, so I'll have to just kind of give you the cliff note version. You cannot go through what you're going through without at least thinking the question. Why is this happening? Mama was a good person. My sister loved God. My daughter gave her all for the things of God. She was in the prime of her life. What's wrong? This hurts. This doesn't seem fair. God, I can think of a dozen people who ain't living half of what Harriet was. And they backstroking through sin. What is this? Why is this? You know, we, we get told, you don't question God. I, you know, I, I understand, I think. But you can't help it. The point of that is don't doubtfully question, don't falsely accuse when we question, but they're questions. She was a good lady. Sooner or later, we all raise those kinds of questions and we want to know what's going on. Oh, so I, I, wanna, I just want to share with you just some of what I've learned over the years and I can't get it all out. So I've nailed it down to four possible answers that you can consider and pray about so that when you leave here, you didn't just go to a building and just have church, but you can live. You can live the way God really wants you to be able to live. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 24, verse 15 and following, God refers to the wife of a prophet by the name of Ezekiel as the delight of his eyes. <laughs> and essentially, the story is, or not the story, but the, the reality is, God says that he was going to suddenly and swiftly stroke 
the delight of his eyes. That was Ezekiel's sweetness. You told him one day and that night it happened. And not very much changed in, in Israel. They were in Babylon. And he required that this man not weep, not give any public display about what was happening. And when you check the record, it was all to be a prophetic. There was a prophetic reason why God allowed it. said, I'm going to let the temple that you guys think of as the delight of your eyes, I'm going to let it be destroyed in Jerusalem. And the captives that are there, or the people that are there, are going to be brought into Babylon. Now, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't... I know there are a lot of people trying to make money off being prophets. How'd you like to be in that role? When God speaks the message, he speaks it through taking your wife. And as God predicted, everything went on and most people did not notice. The, uh, they really didn't even connect with the death of the man's wife until they noticed that he didn't cry. And he had to say to them why he didn't cry. And how the Lord told him to respond. It, it, it almost sounds cruel. People that are involved in prophetic ministry understand that um, there are things that God requires of you. And he doesn't tell you necessarily that it's going to happen. I hope you can stick with me on this. There are some young people here that need more than religious talk to get through this. God has a way of, of dealing that really blows your mind. And, and, and we don't try to do this, but eventually we start to question his morality, his sense of morality. None of us, none of us would stand up and say that, but that's really what starts to happen. This ain't fair, God. My wife dies to say to this nation, that the thing you put your trust in is coming down because there's something happening in you that's not right as a people. That's deep. So the delight of the eyes of a genuine prophetic leader it's being transitioned for prophetic reasons and the call of God and the requirement of God for faithfulness on the part of this prophet is required and expected despite his inability to explain to the people why God chose this method. Reason number two. We start all in life oftentimes trying to um, dream about how we're going to navigate through life and do our thing. And inevitably, we make misinterpretations. Our expectations are not in alignment with what God is really going to do. Let me give you a couple of examples. 
For a couple of decades or more, a guy by the name of Zacharias, who was a priest, and his wife, Elizabeth, was praying for a child. When the child was finally conceived, they were old. When the child was born, they named the child what God said named the child, John. The child just happened to be, from a biological standpoint, uh, the, the son of a woman who was a cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Child is born, he's raised, and at the age of 30, he's executed. No marriage, no family, no offspring, gone. Right on cue. His appointed time. What was his purpose? I'm a voice. I'm not the Messiah, but I'm the guy that's running down the road telling you he's coming. And at age 30, head cut off. Now, in the, in the Hebraic community, having children was a form of eternality. It's how you moved on in life. You passed your name. It was, it was, it was an honor. And so there was shame. They're trying to figure this out. In this case, it's not a, it's not a woman, but it's, it's a man, 30 years old. Here's another example, Acts chapter 7. There's a, there's, a, there's a young man there who was kind of like a deacon in the church and he gave bold witness for Jesus and he stoned to death. A gentleman by the name of Saul held the stoner's coats. So, so here's, here's, the, here's the second reason to consider. The misinterpretation and the miscalculation on our part of the God-given purpose, timing, and ordination of days that the Lord assigns concerning the fulfillment of days can be very costly. Misinterpretation leads to miscalculation. There must be a separation from my expectations and God's divine will. They prayed all those years, and when the baby was born, I'm sure there were expectations that there would be more children, that Zacharias and Elizabeth would become grandparents. priest of God. Not in the plan of God. What was the plan of God? You will be the kind of witness that will die for me. Here's another one. Jesus is born a couple of years later. Herod hears about it. He's so upset. And by the time he hears about it, he finds out he's been tricked by the Magi. He sends out folks, an army to kill all the boy babies. This is the part of the Christmas story we don't talk about. Can you imagine that? Going through morning sickness, pushing out a baby, and a year and a half later, some madman who has the authority politically to release an army against, runs through your village, and snatches your baby, and Bludgeons your baby. What is it? It's fulfillment 
of a prophetic word about Rachel weeping. What kind of God is this? We got to have more than a song and a dance when we leave. We got to have prophetic insight about not only what's going on, but who's behind it. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people just, to be honest, they're just mad with God. They're mad. They're mad. They prayed. They believed. Like the preacher said, believed. And your mama still died. Your daddy still died. Your baby didn't make it home. Misinterpretation and miscalculation can leave you with utter results, devastating results in your attitude about God. What's at stake here? The morality of God. How can God be God? How can God love us? How? 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 And let it hurt this bad. You mean to tell me my baby was born to be a witness? A fulfillment of a prophecy hundreds of years. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Third reason, which probably, well, I'll, I'll say this. Ephesians 2 says, but, but, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins or transgressions made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not as a result of work, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That doesn't seem like a good work, but it is because of the message from God that's in what he's allowed. This doesn't pat pews in churches. You don't get a lot of money when you preach and teach like this. But there's truth here that will make you free. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you know, you, you have to decide at some point to really, you know, we say let God be God, but I mean to approve, to approve God's decisions. So often we endure God's decisions. We we, we put up with them, we, 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 we get upset about it and we, we don't point the finger, we don't give him the finger, but inside, because of our misinterpretations and our miscalculations, we, 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 we stuff it because we don't get it. Oh yeah, we get the death and we get the pain, we, we get how hard it is, but we don't get, we don't get the prophetic relationship here, what God is speaking. And, and I submit to you, brothers and sisters, and those who have still, you're still trying to decide whether or not you, this is really worth your time. Uh, apart from that kind of insight, you will do as has been done for the last multiple millennia. Uh, God, God will let you scream, yell, fuss, cuss, give him the finger, all five or the one in the middle, and at the end of the day, he will still be, he, he, he will, and he, he will be right about what he allowed to happen. Uh, what are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is that Zacharias and, and, and Elizabeth's expectations came out of an interpretation a misinterpretation of who John really was and how long he's gonna be here. 
John had the distinct pleasure of knowing he had fulfilled the will of God that he would not live to be 90 or 110 or 120. And you read the Bible, you know the story, Melchizedek, uh, uh, Methuselah lived 965 years and his son I know it was the other way around. Enoch lived three, 300 years. And he walked with God and left here. And Methuselah, in 965 years, isn't it interesting? It doesn't say he walked with God. Here almost a thousand years, and the word doesn't tell us he walked with God. So which would you rather have? 965 years of just trucking down here or 300 years of walking with God? You see, you see the, very, the very value system that we have has, for the most part in, in the world today, has nothing to do with God. It has to do with me, myself, and I, and what I want, and how life ought to go. It, it really does. Don't get mad at me now because uh, we've got a couple more to go and you're really going to be mad if we, okay? But this is, this is so true. So true. God has works that he's already ordained. And when those works are completed, When they're done, we're out of here. And our expectations and our interpretations about what that ought to look like, it's not that he doesn't care. He knows we don't understand the value of him deciding. And he will take us cussing him out, mad, giving him the finger, wilding out, he'll take all of that because he knows we don't get it. That when he says time's up, he means time is up. And everything we thought ought to be, he doesn't back up and go, oh, my bad. I know you really wanted another 20, another 40. I'll heal you. I'll work with you. I'll deal with you. But I've got stuff for your mama that goes beyond this space and time. I don't try to, I'm not trying to be cliche. She's moved on to the next assignment. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it hurts like crazy. But if you could just, this is the toughest battle you have in your life. You can just let him help you learn to trust him. That's what it is, sweetie. Trusting God is the biggest fight. The Bible calls it the good fight of faith. It's a, it's a trust fight. Do I trust you or do I not trust you? Do I believe you? Do I not believe you? Do I lean on you? Do I not lean on you? Are you telling me the truth? Or are you playing games with me? <laughs> this hurts so bad, God. My only options, I got two options. I can trust you, I can trust you, or I can tell you where to go. And to come to that place requires something that no human being can give us. No preacher. I'm a preacher. I've been doing it. But no preacher can give it to you. 
The young man quoted it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Verses are from that faith is the substance of things hoped for, it's the evidence of things not seen. By it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we, we understand. Through faith, that doesn't even sound right, does it? Through faith, we understand. Through faith, we understand. Through faith, no, 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 we don't understand and then have faith. No, through faith, we understand. Through trusting God, as a result of God convincing us of what truth is to him, that's the understanding. And we step out on that. I say this all the time around here at Metro. You guys have heard me say it. Eve, you know, we need to lay off her a little bit because in the scientific world, she, she couldn't do no tests. She, she couldn't... Con she, she couldn't do a survey. She couldn't do a questionnaire. She couldn't, she couldn't get, she, she had nowhere to go. God said, the day you eat, you're going to die. She, she didn't have no empirical data. That, that, there wasn't a group of people over there that did it and died. If she could see that, she'd go, yeah, you're right. But there was no group of people. There was nobody. And God expected Eve to trust that he wasn't lying to her. See, that's the day. I'm not against science. Please don't leave here saying that preacher don't believe, don't believe in science. It's wonderful. But God does not spell his name S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. His name is not science. Science is a tool that he uses. Wonderful! Science says, I take it, I investigate it, I pull it apart, I analyze it, I analyze the data, I cover it with my conclusions, my generalized principles. This is how I ought to do it. Eve didn't have that. There was no opportunity for her to get that. Yes. The only thing she could do was go by the witness of the Spirit of God that God could be trusted, that he wasn't lying to her. So she got tricked. And Adam with his crazy self standing there looking at it. Oh, you, you, you understand? He went with his girl. He went with his girl. You know it's wrong, but you go with you. Okay, Pastor Ray. <laughs> you know it. You know it's wrong. But you go with your girl. We getting there yet? See, trusting God ain't going with your girl. Remember when God came back to? He said, he said, he said, you know, to the serpent, you're gonna crawl. And to the woman, he said, well, it was the serpent. The serpent, the serpent. You made him, it's, it's the serpent. He's real smooth. He got me. God to the man, he said, well, it's her, it's the woman. You made her, you brought her to me. You know the story? Listen to what God said, because he didn't start with the tree. You know what he started with? It's because you hearkened to the voice of your wife and partook. Ain't nothing wrong with listening to your wife. He gave her him for that. Her name, help, means one who surrounds and protects. Same word used for God himself. But in this instance, you elevated her voice above my voice. 
you didn't trust me. He went with his girl. Now, it's the same dude, and he named animals, man. He could, he, he could sense the nature of the thing. It's not written here, but I just, I just believe he had to have sensed something ain't right. You see, this is, and I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying, I'm almost done. This is, this is really major. What's happening in this room today, that's why pastor's walking like this. Because he's determined that you get it. I can't make you get it. But he's the, God has determined that you get it. And he's determined that the devil's vision for your life gets ruined forever. And that you can begin to see your life in light of what your mama and your daughter and your sister and your auntie and your cousin knew. I'm not even saying that she knew exactly it was time. You, you, you know sometimes when you used to go by your friend's house and then your dad and your mom showed up an hour early? They told you you could stay at nine and they showed up at seven? You don't want to go. Because you said nine. In fact, I was hoping it was going to be ten. That you'd be late. But in my mind, you're early. But what you don't know is something has happened and daddy got to get you now. What you don't know is all the works that God has ordained for Herod to walk in that requires that she not be earth bound. Amen. Say this to your neighbor, earth time. I'll start like this. Sometimes earth time is overrated. Two more and we're going. The next one is easy. It's the one that almost all of us think of, except in this case, which throws us for a bit. It says here, the redemptive, but the disciplinary judgment of the Lord. Sometimes women and men leave here because of high-handed sin. Where you get that term from? Numbers chapter 15, the Bible speaks about a person who, well, the Lord is explaining to to, to the nation of Israel, how he deals with people when they sin and they don't know they've sinned. It's called unintentional. Trespass offerings and those kinds of things. Then God says near the end, now, if you know you're doing it, don't, don't bring me no offering. Okay, so it's, it, instead of getting scared, I, every one of us ain't ought to say, oh, God, you surely are merciful. Because... <laughs> Even though you didn't, you could have took me out immediately because I know that was wrong. So the word of God says, number 15, verse 30, 31, a person that sins with a high hand, it just means defiance or rebellion. Uh, don't bring the offering because basically you, you're out of here. First John chapter 5, similar thing. If you're praying for a brother that has committed a sin that leads or results in death, stop praying. Because the judgment is already written and God is going to. Now, we don't always know when that's the case, do we? So we pray and we ask the Lord and then God says, now, that, that, that isn't, this isn't Harriet's case, right? It's, it's not Harriet's case. Uh, she's not perfect, but there's not been some, some major defiance against God. But, but there are some, uh, that's the case, like Ananias and Sapphira. She knew she was lying. She knew she was lying. She, she, you ain't gonna tell me and Sapphira didn't know she was lying. She knew she was lying. But she lied anyway. Poof. Here's the wonder. Do you really think that Sapphira was the only one that lied that day in the church? Probably not. 
I'm going to tell you as a pastor, no! <laughs> What's happening here? The mercy of God and God allowing this death like shockwaves to go through the whole church. Because the truth be told, God could have took a whole lot more people out that day. So, so when, we, when, we talk about, when we talk about what God is saying and what God is doing and why this is happening, the point that I'm trying to get to is that there is there's a divine appointment that's being met here. Here's a fourth reason to consider. Sometimes we go through Job-like experience. You all remember Job? Woke up one morning, one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest man in the world. Who's the guy that owns Amazon? What's his name? Bezos. Okay, a Bezos type of guy. Warren Buffett kind of guy. I mean, he got money coming out. He got so many camels, so many Benzes, so many Beamers, so many Bentleys. That's what camels were back in the day, right? Okay, that's, that's really what they were. Yeah, and, and he had plenty of it. Wakes up one morning. Everything is torched. Everything is gone. Ten kids partying at one of the relatives' house. They die. And here's Job. All this money, nothing. He goes through. We can't go through the whole story. But he goes through all of this. And in chapter 42, here's what, God, here's what Job says. And he, had to, he had this encounter with God, and he's dealing with God, and he was really borderline. He, his wife said, hey, and, you know, kind of give her a break. Her, 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 her babies now, her babies, her 10. She pushed out 10 babies. They're all, not one or two of them, all of them in the same day. Who can psychologically handle this? Who can emotionally handle it? So she tells, she tells Job, hey, you're still trying to maintain your integrity? Go ahead, just curse God. Let him kill you. It's over anyway. So Job, Job talks to God. God deals with Job. All of his counselors come. Job, the Lord tells them late in chapter 42, nothing that they said was appropriate for Job. One young man comes, he gets closer to really helping Job to get on point. Job is arguing his justice, he's arguing his sense of rightness, all of his... And, and God finally gets through to him and shows him that he's been dealing with a Leviathan. That was an, that's an old term that speaks of kind of like a, a huge uh, uh, animal that's in, in the sea. We call them sea monsters today. Or he's, he's kind of dealing with a, uh, with a behemoth. Uh, he, you're dealing with the, with the king of the children of pride. That's what he tells him. In other words, you're dealing with Satan, and I let Satan touch certain aspects of your life. Because uh, I'm proving prophetic. I'm proving to Satan that you're not serving me because of the Bentleys. You're not serving me because of the property. You're not serving me to be religious. You love me. He proves it to him. And so here's what Job has to say. When he answers the Lord, he says, I know that you can do all things, verse 2, and that no plan of yours is impossible for you. Old King James Version says, shall be thwarted. It's not going to be overthrown. What's Job saying? Uh, who is this who conceals advice without knowledge? Therefore, I've declared that which I did not understand. I've talked to you, God. I said a lot of stuff, and I didn't understand what I, what I was saying. Things too wonderful for me, which I do not know. Please listen, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent, sitting in dust and ashes. Joe, Joe basically says, you had a purpose for this. And, and now I get it. No purpose of yours is going to be overthrown. I'm done, preacher. I'm done. I'm done. Join the club.
No purpose of yours is going to be overthrown. It wasn't, it wasn't John. It wasn't like God said, come here, Job. Me and Satan had to talk. He's convinced that the only reason why you're serving me is because of all the bling bling I gave you and all the stuff I'm doing for you. Okay, so uh, how about we come into agreement that I'm going to let him whip your behind for as much as he, as I let him do that. And you just hold on to me because we're we going to come through this. See, I know you, son. I know, I know that you really love me, and I know you're for me, and I know you trust me. You pray every day. You pray for your kids every day. You help the poor. You give wise counsel to people. You're really in this for the right reason. But I, I got, I'm going to show him something. And uh, just, just keep walking with me. We're going to get through this. God didn't say that to Job. Job wakes up, and all hell breaks loose. And he walks through it, and he believes God, and he trusts God. And at the end of the day, even through all of his wrangling, he says, I thought I really got you, but now I get you. I see it. No purpose of yours. No purpose of God will be overthrown. The purpose that he had for allowing your sweetness to come home now. Your mama, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's not cliche. He's, he, she really is cool, but he, you're hurting. God left her here long enough to teach you what needed to be taught so that his purpose. You guys have been set up to not just give the devil the black guy, but I mean rip his juggler. wants you to do is to give it's not even the last thing she never wants this is to give the devil what he wants don't you do it don't you do it don't you do it you know your pain you were standing in the room with brother breathe this last I dropped to the floor and grabbed this the bed I stopped calling him back his widow was sitting down and the heavenly peace of God came upon me And then the peace was a voice. He's with me now. A year too late, I was talking to his only daughter. She asked me a question. She said, Uncle Bray, if God knew this was going to hurt like this, why did he do it? Why did he let it happen? And I said, baby, I, I don't know the answer to that. But I know this. Your daddy raised you with this little model from the word. She started reciting it with me. I was born to worship God. 
with perfect praise in my generation. So whatever the reason was in God's mind, baby, we're going to have to trust him. You get about the business of doing what you were raised to do. So I want, I want to pray now. The title of my message is Celebrating a Godly Queen's Appointment. Reservation was made. Like Joe, God didn't tell you. He didn't give him no vision. He didn't give him no. He didn't give him no dream. It was just going to be another tough day at the office, but we was going to come home. We was going to snuggle again tonight. We was going to get to it. But God, God, sir, He loved just this. I can guarantee you, I'm going to have to tell you, you know it. The last thing she wants any of us to do is to falsely accuse God because we've misinterpreted something God has done. Instead, we will grieve with hope, with an expectation in our spirit based upon the fact that God isn't lying. He's telling the truth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not his word. The Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the trump of God, to the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ, that's Harriet Skates, will arise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together caught up together with Harriet to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord last statement I realize that a lot of this may sound like pie in the sky and may sound like just myth you know that's what they tell you tell you this is how you listen to preachers who talk like that because they speak in platitudes and they talk about a bunch of stuff that they can't prove I don't have to prove it he proved it he rose from the dead and all the other religions that profess of a resurrection they're the ones that have no proof Jesus rose 500 folk at the same time you know you know you know what they tell you in in, in behavioral sciences that's psychology sociology so forth no two people see the same hallucination at the same time. That means even if they all were smoking weed, they wouldn't all see that at the same time. If they were sloppy drunk on Jack Daniels, they wouldn't all see that at the same time. But 500 of them saw him. When, when the apostles came back into the room and they were scared that maybe they were going to be arrested, the one who created the universe superseded the, the laws of thermodynamics and, you know, Star Trek is late. He materialized in the room. He said, I know you're tripping, but let me show you. You see, this is where the nails were. This is where the spirit went. This is the real deal. Give me your hand, boy. Put it in the holes. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. What you feel of flesh and bones, I'm alive. <laughs> Hallelujah, I'm alive. Somebody bless the Lord up in this place. Would you turn around and yell it? He's alive. <laughs> Ain't nowhere in the world, I, I'll tell you. There's nowhere in the world I'd spend this kind of time. I'm already past. I'm past, I'm six minutes past the time, all right? So we got to move quick. 
How many of you are convinced that Jesus Christ is alive in this room? Somebody give him a shout up in this place. Come on, stand. Okay, let's stand together. Before we go, God has a great desire. And that great desire is that every person in this room would be in a, a genuine relationship with him. It boils down to this, whose narrative would you believe? The Bible says it like this, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In today's English, whose narrative would you believe? You're going to believe Darwin, you're going to believe Carl Sartre, you're going to believe Karl Marx, you're going to believe Obama, you're going to believe Trump, you're going to believe Biden. Whose narrative will you believe? Here's his narrative. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The robbing of our peace with God was upon him and through his stripes we are healed. That means simply this. Every human being born in the world was born with a problem. And the only way to solve the problem is to take the solution that God gives us. It's very simple. It's not, it's not getting my approval of your life. I'm like you, I need the same solution. The solution is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't die just to get us to the place where we would stop doing wrong things. Jesus died to deal with why we do wrong things. We're sinners. We miss what God really wants. We're shooting at the target and we miss it. We're trying to be good people. We're trying to get this right. We're trying to be kind. We're trying to, we're trying. But it didn't just die so that there could be good behavior. He died to deal with what's causing the behavior to be what it is. He was wounded for our transgression. God so loved the world that he said his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You know what the next verse says? It's rarely quoted, but here's what it says. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he sent him. Some church folk have done that, but that's not why he sent him. He did not send his son into the world to condemn you. That the world might be saved or rescued through him. Rescued from what? The sin problem in our human nature that keeps us from having the right kind of relationship with God and the right kind of relationship with one another. If you're in this room and you realize that you have misinterpreted God, you misinterpreted and miscalculated his reasons for doing what he did, and you now understand what he really came to do. On this day, as we remember this precious jewel, she would have us all to see Jesus and to say yes to him. If you've never done that and you realize your need to do it, will you do that right now? I'm not gonna ask you to come We've got to go get to the cars. We've got to get to the cemetery and then to the meal. But how wonderful it would be for you to say yes to Jesus and to give your heart to the Lord. Let's bow our heads in the presence of God right now. If that's you and you, you see the need and you see the solution that God has for the need. The need is for a relationship with God. That's the solution too based on his terms 
if you want to do that right where you right where you're standing or sitting just a little bit above a whisper say this with me Lord God I've heard your word and I believe it you said Jesus to deal with the number one problem in my life it's my sinful nature and what that leads to so right now I take you at your word and I put my trust in you you died for me that's it you was buried for me you was raised from the dead for me I surrender my life to you now I say yes come in to me be my Savior be my Lord I surrender my all thank you for hearing my prayer thank you for coming to live in me I rejoice this day if that's you right where you are just lift your hand and say that's me I say yes to Jesus there it is I say yes to Jesus all over this place I say yes to Jesus I say yes to Jesus thank you Jesus blessed Jesus blessed Jesus thank you Jesus father we trust you for your blessing your mighty word the will of our God to be upon this people as we leave we trust you for journeying mercies your divine protection and all that must take place as we go through the rest of our day we trust you to minister your peace in every heart and every life in the name of Jesus we ask you for it we trust you for it amen amen okay, thank you I'm gonna ask that the family be allowed to leave first if you go right ahead brother John and just lead your family bless you let's go this way out this door on this side thank you father right there in the back yeah where the cars are you can go down those steps going down these steps up here want to go this way instead okay I sent you the wrong way brother John bless you brother Lamar can we get the pallbearers to help us as well you can meet them downstairs we're gonna go out this side okay all right those of you who are pallbearers we need you first can we come first please oh how he loves me so sing us would you come how he loves us paul bearers please come to the front of the line thank you so much paul bearers please come to the front of the line yes we can just allow the family to leave first paul bearers up front one two three four five okay god bless He loves us, oh how He loves us. God bless you. The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yes, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our head with oil. Our cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. We thank you. Help us, Lord, to be ready for our appointment. Every single one of us to be ready for our appointments. He loves.